so um, for a little bit of context here for our speaker today, um, he is a translator, Bible translator for Bibles International, or a, a consultant. And there's a distinction, I think we're going to get into that. You've already seen it in your homework. Um, but the philosophy or the method that Bibles International uses, working together with translators that are, that are fluent in the language, in the target language, and then the consultants will come and work together with them and kind of resolve issues, uh, helps um, touch on the different things that are going on, <laughs> work through things. I've been able, I've had the privilege to see this process in action. It's neat to watch. Uh, in Manila, there's a project that was ongoing. And so I got to come with Dr. Kerr, actually, uh, was able to jump right in and sit at the sideline, watch some of what was going on. And um, then I've had personal relationships with a number of the guys that are at Bibles International. Troy and I were good friends going back to our seminary years. Troy Manning, he's one of the one of the core guys there. Uh, the section that we read and enjoyed from our homework was done together three guys, and it was Dr. Kerr, Troy, and Hans Bernard. Um, so Troy has a very, a very, uh, a very significant hand in the work that's going on here, and then Dr. Kerr has just been there for many years um decades i'm thinking am i correct <laughs> yes okay. yes uh i'm in my 26th year of bible translation so that's all just 26 years um and uh the other connection with dr kerr was just i i just have an interesting memory here but i was i was teaching greek at bju i mean 15 years ago i don't know and he was teaching a translation class and so at some point then we got to cross paths i think even my part of my greek class was able to come sit down with him uh, anyway we're just sitting around lunch and uh he's just talking just lots of energy and excitement and uh anyway it's very engaging very engaging time so i know that that's kind of what i'm hoping we get here i hope that we get some of that same um sit at the sidelines and see a little bit what's going on here. The connection is, of course, going to be on translation, but I mean, you got this. And I, reading reading through the homework um, was exciting to me thinking about this, just to see how much theology and philosophy comes through when you're talking about translation. You know, it's, it's clearly not a mechanical task. And these men are very dedicated to a solid philosophy of scripture. So anyway, that's going to come through. Uh, we'll also talk about, of course, that in respect to Romans, and we'll, I'm, I know that we'll learn a lot through it. So Josh, if you're willing to lead us in prayer, then we'll get started and um, look forward to the time we have ahead. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this time that we have to study your word. And I pray that you would encourage us today with the work of this dear brother who is seeking to make sure every tongue has your word and that it is clear. And I do ask that you would, um, that you would bless Bibles International and their efforts. Their, your word gives us all truth and the words that lead unto life. And I ask then that we would be diligent as a church to make sure that there is not a people group that cannot read your word for themselves. And I thank you that you have given us your word in a language that we can read and that we would not take that for granted. So bless the time we have now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I guess that means I'm on, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Well, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, very, Dr. Arnold, very much for asking me to do this. I, um, I consider it a great privilege to share about the work of Bible translation. I'd like to start out by apologizing for the light that's over my head in my study here. It makes me look like I have a whole halo, and that's just an illusion. Okay, I really don't. <laughs> But anyway, it's kind of a unique sort of look about me. So don't get fooled. I'm just a human being, just like everybody else. Most people have never had much chance to have contact with Bible translation work. 
And I certainly didn't until um, I was in my grad school years in Hebrew. Um, I will tell you, I, I really, really enjoy Greek, but Hebrew is my great love. And so um, I will probably in some way along the way, if you notice, I've got my name, Yirmiyahu on there. I'm involved in a Hebrew class. And so we all have Hebrew names. But um, Bible translation is, many of you may not realize it, but you are living in the greatest period of Bible translation in the history of the world. More translations have been done in the time of the last 50 to 60 years than in the entire 25 and a half, 25 and a half centuries before that. So that is an amazing thing to realize that we are living in that period. And so Bible translation is extremely important. And um, we as a small but um, viable organization are doing our part to help that number of languages that have the word of God in their language to be increased and hoping that the day will come and looking for the day to come when every person on the face of the earth can actually say God speaks my language. And so we're endeavoring to do that. The goal is a whole lot closer than it was before. There are about 8,000 languages roughly in the world and um, there are still probably about maybe <clears throat> three to 4,000 that are either started a translation or don't have a translation. So there's still a lot of languages and these are small groups, but still they are people and people who need to hear God speak to their hearts in their own language. Um, as uh, Dr. Arnold said, I've been involved in Bible translation for 20 and now in my 26th year and have worked in, um, Every continent except for Australia and Antarctica in Bible translation. Okay, so there's still not much um, going on in Antarctica as far as Bible translation, but <laughs> and Australia, I've only traveled through. But when you see the need and when you see especially people receiving the word of God in their own language, it's quite an experience. And so I hope I can share a little bit of that with you this morning as we work or this evening for most of you. I guess I see that we have, um, I can tell by names that there are people from Southeast Asia, the Philippines, and um, also probably the United States. Some of us look like the names are <clears throat> more uh, Western. So we'll try to share. I wish we had time to find out about everyone but I'll leave that to your teacher on a regular basis, but I'm glad to be able to share this time. So I'm going to share a screen with you right now. And this is my sort of outline, the general outline for what we are going to be doing. Um, and um, hopefully you can see that. If uh, Can somebody wave their hand if you can see that screen and the outline? Good, okay. Romans for the exegesis class. Okay, now several things. The general outline will be to discuss certain principles and things that will probably take maybe 10 to 15 minutes, maybe a little more than that. And then we're going to look at specific passages in Romans. So generally that's the outline. We'll have uh, some general principles and then some action, action. And hopefully they will be able to apply the things that we've talked about in general principles. Now I'm going to start out with linguistic principles for translating. And by the way, just so you know, if you want to take notes, it's very helpful because what you write down as you listen sticks in your mind better than what you read later. <laughs> so, but um, <clears throat> I will make this, this document available to you after the class. But let's begin with linguistic principles for translating. Number A, or point A, every language has its own unique grammar, structure, and syntax. And even though you're taking a Greek exegesis class, I wish to tell you that Greek is not better than other languages, okay? <laughs> Greek is simply one of many, many languages, and it has its own unique grammar, structure, and syntax, but your native language, my native language, and the languages that we know and work with, each one has its own unique structure, grammar, syntax, vocabulary, and everything involved in it. And to the point to where each one needs to be treated as a valuable thing and not imitate another language. In other words, one of the things that happens when students start learning Greek is they start to think everything should sound like Greek. 
And of course, that is not true. <laughs> and it also complicates the translation process. As we can see in point B, vocabulary is rarely, if ever, a one-to-one -one match. If that were true, we could just have computer translating would have gone long ago would have been major happening vocabulary is rarely if ever a one-to-one -one match words overlap words make differences between languages um, sometimes one word in one language will cover two words in another or sometimes more um, there's a language in um, uh, central africa where the word for covenant and the word for promise is the same word alikabali and so we had to figure out how to make one sound different. We finally said that the covenant was the big promise. Okay. And so very rarely do you find a way to exactly match up two languages. And then point C, and this is a very important thing. Every word in the original language is important, but every word doesn't get translated per se. Now you might say, oh, well, that sounds terrible. Well, let me just explain it this way. In the original languages, Greek and Hebrew, every word that the writer wrote down contributes to the meaning, all right? So every word is important. And so when we arrive at the meaning, we primarily translate the meaning, but we also do it with regard to the words themselves. So every word gets translated by its communication of the meaning. But it doesn't mean that every word gets equally translated in the same way. And let me explain that to you a little bit further in point D. There are differences between function words and content words in translation. Now, uh, you may be aware of this or not, I don't know, but every language has basically two kinds of words, function words and content words. Content words are the easy ones. Those are the things like house, run, um, good, bad. Those are things that have a clear, easy, precise definition, or at least we can define them pretty well. And they represent either something in the physical world or a concept or something that you can actually imagine and picture in your mind in one way or another. So content words are the, are the um, like I say, the stock in the storeroom, okay, of, of the language. Function words, are the words that can't really be defined, but are critical to how the language is put together. They're what I call the hinge words of a language. Like for instance, the word the in English. How do you, what is a the? How would you define a the? Well, it, it, the is not a thing. It's not a concept. It's not a imagined thing. It's not a idea. It's not a physical thing. It's a word that indicates relationships and links between other content words. Like for instance, the word he, okay? He or she, pronouns. You can't define a pronoun until you know what word the pronoun is connected to. And even then it doesn't define it, it simply links it to the previous content word that we know. Like for instance, he, Joseph, or she, Maria, okay? That doesn't define he and she, it simply tells us what it's linked to. So content words and function words, understanding them in language is very important. And I might say this, that when you start learning Greek, you concentrate on content words. That's what all the little cards are for, you know, to learn your, all your content words or your computer flashcards, however you, ever, ever you do it. The function words, how do you write down a, con a definition for ha? or hutos, or hutos, or hoste, or um, any number of other words. How do you write a definition down for that word that's gonna help you learn it? You don't have a definition, you have a function. So uh, I like to define it this way. When it comes to translation, we are strict with content words, flexible with function words. All right, so we're strict. We wanna make sure that the content words are carefully and accurately translated across the language. And they're actually relatively easy. Function words are different. We have to be flexible with them because every language has them, but they don't function the same. They function in a certain way, but they may not correspond grammatically in the same way. Like for instance, apostrophe S in English. Um, 
um, Edwards car. Okay, the apostrophe S is a function element. It's, it's not a word, it's a morpheme, it's a separate part of a word. It defines a relationship between Edward and car. Now, in some languages, you would say the car of Edward. You couldn't say Edward's car, you have to have a different function word. All right, so the word of is not translated as apostrophe S. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. In any respect, the flex, we have to be flexible with the function words. And here's an important point. Function words, your point to uh, Roman, small Roman numeral two, function words are not translatable, but they are transferable. Now, when it comes to your Greek class and the teachers testing you, they wanna know what, that you know what that word means, <laughs> okay? So when you go to the test, you're gonna to have to put down something for hutos or hosta. But when it comes to translating, you're gonna to have to figure out how it works in the original language and how in the host language that you're translating into, it will work the same way. And it may not be even a word. It may be a syntax. It may be an order of words. And so function words are not translatable, but they are transferable. Okay, so those are some of the things. There's one more point, but I wanna just pause a minute. Does now, I, uh, Dr. Arnold, how are, how are we handling questions? Or um, I wanna tell the class that I am not only open to, but seriously desire questions. How do you handle those? Most of the time, those are gonna come through chat. So okay. uh, like we've had one question come up in chat already. So a lot of times guys will drop those in there. You can you can keep an eye on it if you want or alternatively, and this works just as well, maybe better, I don't know. I can keep an eye on it and pick out some questions once, once we get to a time like this. So however you wanna do that. Okay, I would like it if you would keep track of it because I'm not as adept in Zoom as you probably are. And so no if you can keep track of them and you can just wave your hand or signal me or unmute and say, Dr. Kerr, I've got a question. By the way, I'm still working on my doctorate, so I'm not quite Dr. Kerr yet, but um, whatever titles matter, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, a par par on the way there, a partial, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Here's yeah. a question I'll toss at you. One was okay. at, one of the guys was asking, and I, um, I partially answered it based on what I think I saw in the translator guide. But uh, he mentions Luther argues in his open letter on translation to make explicit what's implicit in the text, i.e., where it says faith to translate as faith alone uh, yeah. because he says it's implicit. What do you think? Um, implicit information is information that is there in the text but is implied so that the original reader understood it completely. But it isn't necessarily written. This could include a lot of different things. Like for instance, um, you can't see it, but I have a handkerchief in my back pocket, okay? The fact that it is not, you can't see it, doesn't mean it's not there, <laughs> okay? Um, when you say the word, the Jordan, like for instance, in the, um, in, the Greek, in the Greek or the English text, in the Hebrew text, that implies river. It doesn't mean the Jordan city, it doesn't mean the Jordan country, it means river. So is river implicit in the word Jordan? Yes. Um, it is part of what we call the mutually cognitive environment of the listeners. So any information that is implicit in the text or ex implicit in the text may or may not need to be translated. It entirely depends upon the specific context. Like for instance, I wouldn't need to say Jerusalem city for most people. Virtually everyone knows that Jerusalem is a city. So you really wouldn't have to, every time you come across Jerusalem, say Jerusalem city. But there are certain other things, particularly when languages do what we call ellipses. Like for instance, um, when um, uh, a writer will, someone will say, um, do you have the book with you? And you answer, yes. Does that mean, what does that mean? It means, yes, I have the book with me. <laughs> okay, I have the book with me is implicit in yes. Okay, in some contexts, you might, and, and we might say, all right, I could say yes, or yes, I have, or yes, I have the book, or yes, I have the book with me. 
Each one of those things would be correct. Yes, yes I have. Yes, I have the book. Yes, I have the book with me. I am expanding what is implicit in yes. Okay, so implicit information is important to weigh and it depends entirely on the context. And I might say this, what I try to do is make sure that any implicit information that we put into the text is grammatically tied to at least one word in the text, okay? So it's grammatically linked to those words, okay? So thank you, that's a very good question. I appreciate the, the opportunity to respond to that. Okay, so we're back to our outline just for a minute. Point E, discourse structure is different between languages and affects translation in ways that are often missed in exegesis. Now, you may or may not be aware of discourse structure, but just like grammar structure and syntax, discourse structure is the way sentences are put together to make a discourse or a text or a, you know, like a sermon, like a story, like a narrative. All of these things are discourses. It's a unit of language that is consistent in content, uh, uh, coherence and cohesion. In other words, it makes sense and it is linked together by various grammatical things. Okay, so discourse structure is also something that needs to be observed in translating because writers will put things in the text in certain ways to indicate the discourse. Let me give you a good example. This is somewhat of a discourse element, but the word um, legon. All right. Um, uh, the word legon is often translated saying. Well, if I translate it saying, and then I put a quotation mark at the beginning of what is being said, I have actually translated the word saying twice because saying is an oral quotation mark, okay? It's part of the discourse structure of Greek. And so if I translate it that way, I have probably also translated it twice. So I really don't need to translate it twice by putting a quote mark in there or whatever else we use in our language to indicate that a quote is started, I've translated it. So the function is important. Also, how, do, how does Paul start and finish every single epistle? He starts with a greeting and he ends with a benediction. And he always has toward the, uh, just about always has toward the right before the benediction, a list of all the people he wants to greet, unless he's writing to Ephesus. And because he knew everybody in Ephesus already, because he spent two years there, he doesn't write to anybody specifically to greet them, lest he leave somebody out. <laughs> okay. So, um, but these things are part of the discourse structure. That's how you write a letter. Okay, and also part of the discourse structure in the big sense of Paul's writing is he does his all of his doctrinal stuff, and then he does his practical stuff. Okay, when you compare that to the writer of Hebrews, for instance, the writer of Hebrews doesn't start with a greeting. As a matter of fact, Paul also starts every single one of his epistles with his name. He says, Paul, <laughs> the writer of Hebrews plunges right into his doctrinal material and he mixes his doctrinal material and his practical application over and over again throughout the book, okay? Then toward the end, he does add a little bit more, but his discourse structure is different than Paul's. He has a different way of writing, okay? And so understanding those differences helps you understand how best to translate because you need to give prominence to the things that the writer is pulling out of his text and put things in proper order. So discourse structure is something that we can't, we can't possibly cover this morning, but I'll try to whet your appetite for it. If you wanna learn more about discourse structure, it is very important because the biggest thing about discourse structure is it gives you the big picture of the text. And the big picture of the text is very important. Okay, so any other questions or comments about linguistic principles for translating? All right, if not, let's go on to lexical techniques in translation. Okay, point A, using Greek lexicons. Small Roman numeral I, one. Lexicons are just good opinions. Now, don't be too shocked. <laughs> 
Lexicons are not laws. Lexicons are not written in stone. They're good, very good. But remember, they are just good opinions. And lexicons disagree with each other sometimes. And so lexicons are a great valuable help and source of information, but they're opinions. They're not hard and fast documents. And so they must be treated with a certain amount of care. The biggest thing about the lexicon it will do is help you begin to get a handle on the, um, the meaning of words. <clears throat> Point two, or Roman, Roman numeral two, small Roman numeral two, lexicons are best for content words. You can see that. Content words are the easiest and the most necessary to define, okay? Point three, Roman numeral three, lexicons can lead astray for function words, okay? Now that doesn't mean that they're telling you things wrong, it's just that they can give you a wrong impression sometimes, okay? Let me give you an example, I'll give you two examples. Number one, we've been told, and I don't know if you've been taught this, that there's no indefinite article in Greek, okay? I was taught that when I was starting out Greek class uh, 40 some odd years ago, <laughs> maybe 50. Um, there is a definite indefinite article in Greek. And that is the word tis. Tis functions like the a or an in English. As a matter of fact, what you'll see in older translations is they'll usually say a certain man did this. And they're translating tis as certain. But they put in a, a certain man. Well, a is the translation of tis and certain is, un is unnecessary. As a matter of fact, certain is misleading. The word tis introduces new information. That's the purpose of tis, is to introduce new information. That's tis without the accent. That's not the question, okay? So tis is an indefinite article. It functions exactly like the indefinite article in English does, or very close to it. All right, so lexicons can lead you astray. Let me give you another example. I think I can share this screen here. Let's see if you see this. Um, can you see the Greek, uh, the accordance screen now? Good. Okay. Now notice here I have, over here on the right, I have the word prophetes. Okay. Prophet. That's easy. Okay. That's a very clear definition of prophetes is a person inspired to proclaim or reveal divine will or purpose, a prophet. Good. Okay. That works. But now let's pick out a word like hyper. Okay. Uh, okay, there we are. Huper. One, a marker indicating that an activity or event is some entity's interest, is in some entity's interest. For, in behalf of, for the sake of someone, something. Okay, so we do have a definition at the end, or at least we have possible English equivalents. But what we primarily have is a description of the function. A marker indicating that an activity or event is in someone, some entity's interest. Okay. And then if we look down further, we see that a marker of the moving cause or reason, because of, for the sake of, for. Now, you might get the impression that the only possible translations of this are because of, for the sake of, or for. But that's not true. It's also a marker of general content, whether of a discourse or mental activity about concerning. The problem with this is this is not a uh, multiple choice question where you can pick whichever one you want. You have to understand what Huper does in the context before you can translate it. And if you're doing it in English, you may find out that none of those work. And if you're doing it in your own language, you might find out that you have no idea how to cr cross over from one to the other because you need to understand how the word works in the Greek language and then correspond that to working in the um, language that you're working with. So I just point that out because lexicons can lead astray for function words. And then point four, one should not rely on only one lexicon, okay? And one should also understand that lexicons sometimes are older and newer. And sometimes lex lexicons skip the word that you need, <laughs> okay? so. Lexicons should be learned how to use them. And here's a point number five, uh, Roman numeral, small Roman numeral five. One should do some in-depth word studies to better understand lexicons. 
you really won't understand a lexicon as well as you can until you've done the type of word study that the lexicographer did themselves. In other words, try, take a word and study it and figure out how you would define it based upon the information that you've seen. As you do that, you gain two things, a much better understanding of the word and an understanding of the process that brings about the lexical entry. And so therefore you'll really be able to handle what the lexicon is doing better, okay? All of this takes time, but understanding a language is a lifetime investment and everything that you do is building upon what has, you've done before. Okay, so um, second point under lexical techniques and translation, doing word comparisons. Okay, so we're talking about individual words under Jews and Greek lexicons. Now we're talking about word comparisons. Words exist in what are called semantic domains. A semantic domain is the domain of the words that have essentially the same ideas shared, but may not usually are not the same meaning, but have the same um, general domain of meaning. Like for instance, let's say dwellings or habitations. Okay, you could have a house, a hut, a cottage, an apartment, a um, tent, all of those in the domain of dwellings have that same domain, but they're different within that, okay? So each one has a different purpose, but they all have one share, thing sharing in common. And so semantic domains is an important way of understanding what a language is using in its vocabulary. And then the second thing, and like for instance, on the word sin in the Greek New Testament, um, there are probably 10 or 15 different words that imply or have the domain of sin. Let me show you that in, um, let me give you another instance of that. Um, okay. Um, all right, this is, uh, let me go bring up. Okay, here it is. This is Loanida's Greek lexin, lexica, and I'm, All right, hamartia or hamartano. Here's the domain of sin, wrongdoing, or guilt. Within this domain, you have hamartano, hamartima, ptayo, aptaistos, pro amartano, hamartolos, hamartolos. Um, now, this is an adjective and this is a noun. Hugerbino, paraptoma, ophelo, ophelima, uh, opheletes. Radiurgia, agnoita, agnoima, deliazzo, scandalizzo, scandalizzo mai, scandalon, proscoma, perazzo, aperastos, amartia, hamartema, hamartetos, enochos, enochos, poliros, aition, anaitios, um, amemtos, aproscopos. All of those exist in the domain of sin, wrongdoing, and guilt. Every one of those has something in common, but many, many things that are different. Okay, if you're going to understand the concept of sin in the New Testament, that list would be a good starting point. But now that's just, that's just Greek. Now suppose I'm wanting to translate this into Saramajingai or Tagalog or um, <clears throat> into um, Kaolong or any other number of different languages or uh, Ilocano or something like that. How am I going to do that? I have to then make a list in my language of all the things that I can think of that have to do with sin, guilt, wrongdoing, and then see how they match up with the words in the original language. That way I can figure out what words possibly can be used to translate those other words. So these lists in one language compared to lists in another is a constant task that translators do all the time. I've done this with translators all over the world numerous times. We did this, I remember doing this in Ghana one time when we were trying to figure out all the magician words in Daniel. <laughs> And we had to um, come up with all kinds of different things. 
We did this in Luxembourg in Europe recently on the same subject, magicians. And we discovered that Luxembourgish has very, very few words for magicians compared to like, for instance, English. And so these lists are like stacking up the possibilities. And then there's the concept of components of meaning. And components of meaning are the individual parts that make up the meaning of a word. Like for instance, dog is a four-legged, Eat meat eating animal with a tail and um, other things too. But there's five components of meaning. Okay, now every dog doesn't have a tail and a dog could lose a leg and only be a three legged dog. Okay, <laughs> but the point is that those are components of meaning of the core of the word. And understanding those components, those separable units, helps us in translation. And this is one reason why Lowenida's Greek lexicon is very valuable. And I don't know if you're acquainted with it or if you have it, but it is organized according to semantic domains and gives you a really good way of understanding how words relate to each other within a given language, especially, of course, in this case, in Greek. All right, let me pause just for a minute. Lexical techniques and translation. Do we have any questions or comments or thoughts? I am um, your your discussion about lexicons. These are just uh, these are just carefully curated viewpoints. This is a person with a really big megaphone who's giving his viewpoint on the word is helpful. Uh, just because we do, we open up the lexicon and just take it as inspired from on high. Um, I was helped by a concept in a it was a it was like an advanced lexicography course on Greek specifically, but helped by a concept of definitions versus glosses which I yes. realized at that point, so often I'm opening up, like especially shorter lexicons or something, but they give me a word, this Greek word equals this English word. And mm -hmm. there it is. And that's that's easy and quick to memorize, but like BDAG actually giving me a definition, a written out way of trying to, to uh, circumscribe the meaning is, is a lot, it's a lot better of a method. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah, lexicons have different functions. See, a lexicon that just has a short definition is there to help you read quicker. And so it gives you a handle on things as you're going along. Um, a lexicon like BDAG is much more in depth, okay? And so, um, and then you've got something like Tim, the Anna the Greek New Testament, the Freeburg New Testament, great uh, lexicon. And that's a quick definition lexicon. And there's an even quicker one. There's the GNT, the UBS Greek New Testament that's at the end of the, and those are even, shorter. So each lexicon has a different goal in mind. And so you need to understand why the lexicon is doing what it's doing. Okay. And lexicons are your friends, but they are not the only possibility. As a matter of fact, I remember hearing a story about some professor who was talking about some particular word one time, and the student raised his hand in class and said, but professor, the dictionary says this, and this is what I think it means. I, I say, I think it means this. And I can prove it, I'll show you, I'll pull out my dictionary. And he pulled out the dictionary and the dictionary had this definition. The professor took out his pen and crossed out the definition and wrote in the right one. <laughs> Just remember that lexicons are not inspired. <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> all right. Another thing here, and then we'll get into some passages here. How are we doing time-wise? Okay, I'll hurry through this. Exegetical mistakes. And I won't take too much time for this, but just I'll read through these mostly. Not seeing the forest for the trees. Important in exegesis not to focus on details too much. One of the biggest concept, point A, decoding rather than reading. Um, most of the time when we're learning Greek, we're learning how to decode it, meaning we're analyzing each word and then trying to put it together, but we're not reading. Okay, the two most powerful elements in your language learning are your mouth and your ears. You need to read and listen to Greek. You need to read it out loud, get it into your mouth and listen to it and get it into your ears. It's definitely been proven by second language acquisition studies that even if we read silently, we are still reading aloud to ourselves <laughs> because sound is what creates language. And so if you're going to learn a language, 
you need to hear it and speak it. Even if you don't do it much in class, you need to do that because you will gain more about the language by learning to read it and speak it. Read it aloud, hear it spoken, and speak it yourself. If you get it into your mouth where you're actually pronouncing the words, your mind knows what to do with that kind of thing. Your mind knows how to create an understanding of the language. It just needs input. And the input comes through your mouth and through your ears. All right, very important. Basing point B, basing too much on function words, especially prepositions. Okay, prepositions are function words and they are very flexible. So don't base your theology on a preposition, okay? <laughs> you base your theology on the relationship that the preposition shows you between various words, but it can be done very wrong. A good example of this, and it's not, it's in Hebrew, you'll forgive me if I can use this. There's a phrase that's been translated, God of my righteousness in some of the Psalms. And I've read articles describing God of my righteousness, God who makes me righteous. The trouble is that in Greek and Hebrew, God of righteousness is in a relationship of what we call construct relationship. It's a genitive relationship. And my has to be put on the end. So what God of my righteousness actually means is my righteous God. It doesn't mean God of this righteousness of mine. It simply means my God of righteousness or my righteous God. God of righteousness is an adjectival relationship between the two nouns. And so there, again, we have to understand, we can't put too much work on function words. You've got to understand how it works. C, failing to understand why something is said one way when it could have been said another way. And you will only get this as you learn to read and learn to understand the language. D, failing to follow the argument. What is happening in the text? Why is this, what, what part does this verse, this phrase have in the argument of the writer as a whole? Failing to see the big picture and the discourse structure. Again, I, I can't talk too long on that. And then the errors of totality and identity transfer. Totality transfer is when you try to transfer all of the meaning of a single word into every single verse, okay? Every word does not carry all of its components of meaning into each verse. And identity transfer is when you find it means one thing in one place and you transfer that over to another place and it's a different context and it means something different. And then putting too much weight on single words out of immediate context is basically another way of saying what I have in F. H, not recognizing the literary genius of the writers of scripture. Uh, this is a very important, realizing that they're not writing just a string of words, they're writing a document, they're writing a beautiful letter with grace and style and skill. And that leads into not, I, failure to understand poetry and style. There's a lot of poetry even in the New Testament. And then J, failure to read the Old Testament enough. And I can't stress this enough. You just don't understand the New Testament too often if you don't know the Old Testament. There's a good example of this. Let me just show this real quickly. Um, all right, here. Um, let me go to... Um, okay, Luke 6.1. All right, the word deuteroproto is found in the traditional text, and it's not found in the critical text. The word deuteroproto means second first, second first Sabbath. Well, if you knew your Old Testament, you would realize that the reason deuteroproto is in there is because the numbering of the Sabbaths after the waving of the Omer was a regular part of the harvest season every year. And so if you look at the Hebrew translations by, Kyle, by Dalich and Salkins and Ginsburg of the New Testament, where they translated it in Hebrew, both of them translate this word exactly right. The scribes down in Alexandria didn't know what the word meant, so they left it out. Okay, here's a case where understanding the Old Testament will make a big difference. And if you realize, if you read the Old Testament, you realize 
that that's exactly what is being said, that they're talking about the time when the harvest was coming in and they numbered the weeks. This is where we get Pentecost, the 50 days, the seven weeks. And so the weeks were each numbered. And so the weeks were important. This was the second week after the first Sabbath, which is when the grain would have been just ripe enough to go out and rub it and eat it. It has still kind of green and chewy rather than being actually all dried and therefore needing to be ground up to be eaten and made into flour. So again, failure to read the Old Testament enough. We know our Old Testament, we know exactly what those disciples were doing. Failure to know well the historical and cultural background of a passage. And that's just one example of it there. So those are some of the exegetical mistakes. And unfortunately, there was a lot of them. But the more you read, the more you get into understanding the text, the better you'll be. All right, so let's, let me pause again. Are there questions or comments or thoughts? I see that we have seven things up on <laughs> something that says more seven, oh, seven chats. Is there anything I should right. be? I think we're good. Just kind of interaction about different things, but not uh, questions okay, per se. So I think we're good. Good. Okay. Let's, um, let's look now at our first, um, my first note, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Um, and let me bring up the text here so I can bounce back and forth between it too, okay? So here's Romans 1.1. 1, 1. I'm going to enlarge the text a little bit more so you can see it clearly. Paulos, doulos, Jesu Christu, Plato's apostolos, aphorismenos, es evangelion teu. All right, the word doulos. Um, of course, it means bond slave, right? Well, that's the Greek meaning. But if you read the Septuagint, doulos translates over and over and over again the Hebrew word haved, which simply means servant, um, slave, officer. It has a wide separate set collections of meanings. And so here we are. Are we using common Greek usage? Or are we using the Septuagint or Hebrew usage to define the word? Here again, this is a critical thing. Would Paul have used doulos in the sense of bond slave, like Greek would be using? Or is he using it in the sense of like servant and um, you know courtier even of Jesus Christ? This is a case where our understanding of the cultural background of what is being done is important. Paul is a Jew. He's read the Septuagint and the Hebrew since he was a child. And which way is he more likely to go? With the Greek usage or the Septuagint Hebrew usage? I'm not gonna answer that question for you. It's just a question to think about, okay? I have my opinion, but I think that too much has been done about bond slave um, because I don't think that necessarily Paul is saying that he is a bond slave of Jesus Christ. I think he's simply saying he's a servant. Okay, so I won't um, I won't go into that too much farther. Okay, let's look at one Hebrews uh, Romans one one through six. Paulos dulos Jesus Christu Kletos apostolos aforis menos es evangelion to you ha por efele pengela ta diaton trofeton atu es grafais hagiais peri tu huiu atu tu genomenu en spermatos labid katap sarka tu horis mentos huiu theu en diname katap pneuma hagiosines es anastasios anastasios yekron Jesus Christu curiu hemon di hu elabomen that's one sentence. <laughs> and actually it goes on. Um, all right, Paul has one seven verse sentence right there at the beginning. This is very common um, in Paul's writings. It's also relatively common in Greek. And long sentences are common in Greek. And there's two terms I wanna teach you here, hypotactic structure rather than paratactic. Okay, um, hypotactic, well, let me start out with paratactic. That's the easier one. Paratactic structure is where you line up things in a line. Okay, I went to town and I rode the bus and I got off the bus at the bus stop 
and I went into the store and I bought some tangerines and I went out of the store and I went home. Okay, that's paratactic structure. I'm just running all things. Because I was out of oranges, I decided that I needed to go to town. And since the bus was running, I got on it and got off at the store. But the store front door wasn't open, so I had to find a way in. This is hypotactic structure, where things are linked to each other in different levels, okay? Hypotactic structure is typical of Greek. Paratactic structure is typical of English, okay? So a match between Greek paratactic structure and English, a, a Greek hypotactic structure and English paratactic structure is going to require some ingenuity. <laughs> Most of the languages that I know of in the world and that I've worked with are paratactic, okay? Most of them just line up things, okay? Okay? Greek is a highly hypotactic structured language. German is like this, okay? German is very hypotactic, okay? It stacks up things on top of each other and links things together, okay? So understanding that Greek works like that means that we're gonna have to figure out how to say it and we're gonna have to break up the sentences. We're gonna have to make them shorter. We're gonna have to link them in other ways, okay? So that's a common thing that happens in between Greek and Hebrew. And this kind of scares people sometimes, I'll be honest with you. People get scared of this, like, oh, I've got to follow the order of the Greek. Well, if you had the equipment to do what the Greek does, you could do that. But if you can't handle it, then it's, it has to be handled another way. Let me, let me give you an illustration. Um, I imagine a lot of things get shipped from the Philippines and from Southeast Asia to the United States. Okay, and they ship them in canoes because canoes are really handy to cross across the ocean, right? They ship them in huge boxed containers on a very, very large cargo ship, okay? That's like Greek, okay? We pack an awful lot into a big container and we ship it across. When it gets to the United States, those boxes are taken off the ship one by one, they're opened up, and the contents are moved into smaller packages. And so somebody in New York gets this one package, somebody in Boston gets another package, but the content is all the same. It just has to be packaged different. We want to keep the content the same, but we have to break down the size of the packages sometimes, okay? We keep the content the same, but the organ, or, or, organization of the content has to be handled differently. So the Greek is the big cargo ship and English, Tagalog, Kaolong, um, Satamajangai, um, any number of other languages are the smaller boxes and boats. And maybe somewhere along the line, somebody has to have it put in a canoe and brought across the lake to their little cabin. <laughs> okay, so all of that explains how we have to handle this structure. We keep the content the same, but we may have to break down the structure and move it in smaller packages. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, all right, okay. Point, all right, let's look at verse nine. Um, verse nine, gar. Okay, there's that word gar, which we know means this is the reason for or because. Gar and function words, I've already talked about the difference between function words and content words. Gar is a function word and appears 1,063 times in the New Testament and 144 times in Romans. Meaning and suitable translation are two different things. And frankly, Paul has a penchant for gar. He likes it. He uses it a lot more than other New Testament writers. Let me show you, I've got an example. I've got a chart here of this. Um, all right, just a minute, it's down further here. Okay, here's gar in the book of Romans. Okay, and you'll notice if you notice the content, gar, in certain chapters is used more. And these are the chapters that are argumentation chapters primarily. 
All right, but look what happens in the New Testament and whole as a whole. Guess who uses gar more than anybody else? Other than the writer of Hebrews, Paul outstrips everybody. Romans, Second Corinthians, First Thessalonians. Oh, and Second Peter, because the writer of Second Peter, well, Peter was trying to imitate Paul a lot. So First Corinthians, Galatians. You can see that Paul uses gar a lot. Okay. So we're going to have to be careful when we start translating God with one thing. We've got to find imaginative ways to translate God where we're not always translating it with the reason is, okay? We might want to translate it sometimes as, oh, also, or uh, in fact, or indeed, sometimes it's simply emphasis, okay? So we need to understand how the word functions in order to translate, translate it. So guard is a very interesting and um, important word along the process. Okay, now, um, do we, uh, Dr. Arnold, do we take breaks? Uh, like, do you take a break or anything about, the, we're, we're just about at the end of the first hour. We usually take about a five minute break. So um, if you want, if this is a good time, we could pause here and just come back, say at five minutes after the hour, uh, that you know, gives us five minutes and some change. So yeah. up to you, if you want to keep on going with oh. other topics, we can or we can stop here. Great, all right, this is then good. let's this do is that. Good place. All right, sounds good. <laughs> so come back in uh, five, minute, five minutes after the hour, we'll pick up here and continue on. So good, thank okay, you all. Thank you. Um, let me just mention one more thing about God. Um, let me look, I want to show you what the, uh, what BDAG gives for God, okay, just so you understand how this is um, translated. Um, let's see where it, it's verse, not, I think it is, yeah, okay. Come on, you. What are you doing? Okay, gar, Car marker of cause or reason, marker of clarification, marker of inference, inference. Okay, and in each one of these sections, you notice that they give a possible English translation, but then they give examples of how to translate in numerous other passages. Gar is a word that is not going to function the same way in, it's going to function one way in Greek, and it's going to function very differently as far as the meaning in your language. So it's again, it's an issue that we have to recognize that the content of things change um, depending upon the specific context. Okay, um, are we back? I'm sorry, if I got the screen back again? Okay. Okay, good. All right, Adel Foy in the plural. All right, adelphoi is listed in the plural in all of these passages here that you see in Romans. And um, we usually translate this brothers or brethren. Were there no women in the church in Rome? <laughs> um, this has been recently, and I think rightly, realized that adelphoi in the plural many times means brothers and sisters, because Greek has grammatical gender on nouns, and you can tell what, in other words, Adelphos, Adelphe, Adelphos is brother, Adelphe is sister. Well, if you want to say brothers and sisters, what do you say? Adelphoie? <laughs> you can't, you have to pick one form or the other, okay? So the masculine form is the generic form. So when we translate it, if we say Adelphoi brothers, that we have left out possible implications. Now, let's not put in sisters every time brother appears, but when it is in the plural, in some cases, it probably should be translated as brothers and sisters. In some cases, it shouldn't be. It depends again on the context, but it's an important point to realize that autofoy is simply the plural may mean brothers and sisters many times. Okay, yes, somebody, I figured we'd get comments on that. <laughs> I noticed that the number of comments went up to 13 chats. Uh, is there any anything about that we should talk about? 
<laughs> just someone commented here. I think the NASB 2020 does that without Adam Foy. Right, um, they do. Yeah, the um, the American Standard has done it. The NIV did it originally in 2011. It's becoming more common to recognize it, even in conservative translations. Okay. Um, verse okay, verse 13. Let's look at verse 13 here, just for a minute. And there you see, Uthelo de Himasagnuin Adelfoy, Hati Polakis Pra Ethemin, Ethemin, Ethem Prosimas. Okay. So, um, U thelo de humas agnoen. U thelo de humas agnoen. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. Okay, Greek has a great love of negatives. Okay, negatives in Greek are very common. As a matter of fact, um, when Jesus was telling the disciples about the destruction of Jerusalem, he says, there's not one, don't you see these stones? First of all, he uses ne negative, don't you see these stones? Not one of these stones will be left upon the other, which won't be thrown down. Okay, so you've got four negatives in, in just a brief two sentences, okay? That's because Greek loves negatives. Greek is very, and often what happens is, they get confused in um, other languages. So a number of the African languages where I've worked in Central Africa, they put, they put the negative as a single word at the end, okay? And so you can't have more than one negative because you say what you wanna say and then say no. It's like, I'm going to town, not, <laughs> okay? So how would you handle don't you see these stones? There's not one stone that's upon another that's not gonna be thrown down. What you would say is you would reverse the polarity. You would have to because your language doesn't have enough negatives to do it. You would have to say every stone that you see here is going to be thrown down, okay? The polarity many times has to be reversed in order to get across. Now in this case, I don't want you to be ignorant is possible, but you could also simply say, I want you to know and reverse the polarity of the two negatives, not an ignorant and reverse it to yes, no. <laughs> yes, K-N-O-W, I want you to know or understand. So um, the concept of negatives many times has to be handled differently in languages. And then in verse 14, we've got an interesting thing. All right, I'm a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. The word barbaros, um, in English, the word barbarian means somebody who's really crude and just sort of like, you know, an animal rather than being a person. <laughs> okay, is that what Paul is saying here? He's saying I'm a debtor to the Greeks and to the non-Greeks. All right. He's not saying this is a case where our, um, we can get messed up with the root fallacy or borrowed words and they're changing meanings. Okay. Um, just because barbaros is the root in Greek for the English word barbarian does not mean that they mean the same thing. How many of you ever heard that God loves a hilarious giver? How many of you ever heard a preacher say that God loves a hilarious giver? <laughs> because in the passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul says that, he says, um, hilaros. And hilaros is the origin for the English word hilarious. But hilaros and hilarious do not mean the same thing. <laughs> hilaros simply means cheerful, happy. It doesn't mean hilarious, okay? So words get borrowed and the there's a fallacy in thinking that a word has a root meaning that somehow is transferred throughout the whole history of a word, okay? So that a word has this root meaning that is carried through somehow through generation after generation. This has been so bis disproved over and over again. Let me give you an, a good example of this. There's a verse in the King James that says, whatever is sold in the shambles eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. What is a shamble? Okay. Well, a shamble 
is a meat market. And in British English, they talk about going to the shamble to get meat. Now they used to, they don't do that much anymore. But in the, in the Elizabethan day, the shamble was the meat market. But today, what do we say when we say something is a shambles? We say it's all messed up. It's all disordered. That kid's teenager's room is a shambles. Well, we get that from the fact that a shamble is a place where meat is prepared and you have to slaughter the animal to get the meat, okay? So it's a slaughter place. And then somebody got this idea of talking about war as making a shamble of a city, making it a place of killing and destruction. And then it got to being where, okay, now this means something that is um, disordered and messy. Okay, so now a shambles in English means a mess. It has nothing to do with meat. It has nothing to do with war. It has nothing to do with killing. Is there a root meaning of the word that's been carried through? Not at all. <laughs> Another good example is the word silly in English. Okay, that person's just silly. Okay, if you go back to um, uh, Elizabethan English, like in Shakespeare, silly means special. It doesn't mean acting weird. And it goes back to the German, the same root as the German word selig, which means blessed. So a silly person was a person who was special because they were blessed by God. So now, are we saying when we see somebody acting silly that God has blessed them to make them silly? <laughs> the root has been lost. Whatever was there to begin with has been so changed that the word no longer carries that meaning. It's completely been transformed. The same thing happens in Greek, is words that were used in the Septuagint sometimes change meaning. And as we go along in patristic Greek writings and later they change meaning again. Like for instance, the word baptizo before the time of the New Testament meant to immerse. By the time we get to the New Testament, it has kept that meaning, but it's also added the idea of a ritual of um, entry into the into Christian into Christianity, and I point this out sometimes to people when I get ready to baptize them. I say, "You realize that the Greek word doesn't mean I have to bring you back up." <laughs> of course, that scares them a little bit, and then I tell you. But don't worry, the Christian understanding of the word means I do. So, <laughs> in other words, it's a picture of the resurrection. But the meaning of the word has been a part of the meaning has been left out. OK, as we've gone along. So words change meaning as they go along. And there's no such thing as a root meaning of a word. Sometimes the meaning will carry on a long time. But oftentimes, words change over time. And this is why understanding the place in history of a particular word is important, OK? Words that were in classical Greek have certain meanings that they don't have anymore in, in Koine Greek. So, okay. So, barbarois doesn't mean um, crude, uh, crude, sloppy people. It means non Greeks, people that were not Greeks. And the reason they called them barbarois because these Eastern people they didn't speak Greek, so they, they spoke barbar. You know, they just spoke un, unclear. And the tribes in North Africa that are the Berber tribes got their name through that because they didn't speak Greek, they spoke barbar. So whatever that is, they're like blah, blah, you know. <laughs> it's interesting, um, I had a speaker, a friend of mine, he was talking about, um, language, about translation issues. And he said, you know, suppose that you were translating into the blah, blah language. And he said, by the way, there is a blah, blah language. <laughs> There's a language in the um, in the Polynesia called blah blah. That's its name. Okay. So words have interesting matches up between other languages. Okay. Uh, verse twenty four. Now this is interesting. This is something that I find very fascinating about Paul's writings. Um, verse. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Okay, um, yeah, one of Paul's chains of nouns. I'll get to the other thing in just a minute. I was saying, all right, entice epithymiais ton cardian aton eskakatharsian. Okay, so we've got this phrase here, 
um, in verse 24. Okay, so we've got this one long phrase there that is linked together with ton auton ace. So we've got three principal words, epithumiais, cardion, akatharsian. Okay, now epithumiais is a noun, but it's a different kind of noun than most nouns. It's what we call an an event noun. There's no such thing as picking up a epithumia, okay? I went down to the store and I bought myself a couple epithumias, okay? <laughs> epithumia is an action. It's longing for something, okay? And the same way with akatharsian is being unclean, all right? So you can translate a noun sometimes as a verb because nouns and verbs are actions and events. So epithumia could be not just longing, but something I long for, okay? In the, the way my heart longs uh, to be, um, the way their hearts long to defile themselves would be another way of translating this string of nouns, okay? As actions, rather than things, because nouns are many times event nouns. We, when I was growing up, we learned that a noun was a person, place, or thing, okay? Then when we got a little longer in school, then they told us it could be a quality, okay? But they never told me that it could be an event. And that's something I didn't learn until I was way into my adult years. A noun can be an event. Baptism, the word baptismos is an event. Someone gets baptized. Someone baptizes someone. It's an event. All right. Resurrection is an event. God raising Jesus from the dead. Okay. So action nouns can be handled as events or verbs. And this is something that sometimes people don't realize that nouns and verbs are actually sometimes very close to each other. Like for instance, we're having a class. Well, what is a class? The class could be the group of students. It could be a, um, in this case, it is an event. The event is we're all getting together and we're listening to Glenn Kerr talk. Okay, <laughs> that's a class right now. <laughs> okay, this class as such, this noun class will never be repeated exactly the same. It's a one-time noun. It'll never be again. Now, it'll be, we might have something close to it, but we're never probably ever going to have exactly the same people together talking about exactly the same thing because it's an event, okay? So it's important to understand that nouns can be understood as events too. All right, now verse 29 was the thing that I wanted to, I, was gonna, I thought I was gonna tell you about, but let me go through this. Look at verse 29, Romans 1, 29. And here is Pepe Romanus passe a hadikia, pornea, poneria, pleonexia, carcia, mestus, fonu, fonu, forid, eridos, dolu, cacoetheas, thisoristas, catgalalus, theos duges, uberistas, uberifanos, aladzanus, efferetas, cacon, gonelsen apetes, asunetas, asintetus, astorgus, aspondus, anelemonos. All right, there's a string there, a list of nouns, okay, or of not just nouns, a list of words. Some of them are nouns, some of them are qualities, some of them are a phrase. And this is something that is very common in Paul's writings. It's what I call Paul's lust for lists, okay? And um, they are throughout the epistles. Let me show you this one right here, okay? They have got adikia, pornea, poneria, pleonexia, kakia. All right, you notice that they all are ending with ia. He's picked five nouns that all end in ia. Adikia, pornea, poneria, pleonexia, kakia. All right, they don't mean similar things, but in English you could say unrighteousness, moral looseness, wickedness, covetousness, and maliciousness. Okay, you could imitate the same type of structure carefully. And then you've got full of fonu, fonu, eridos, dolu, kakoetheas. 
And here we have all basically um, negative qualities, envy, murder, strife, deceit, spite. Um, murder is an event, but this is the idea of just short, simple words. And then we've got people. Thisuristas kakalalus, theusigeis, hubristas, hubereifanus, alazonas, which would be gossipers, slanders, god-haters, aggressors, boasters, braggers. Okay, lists are so common, and Paul is a master of lists. One of the reasons why I'm convinced, one of the several reasons why I'm convinced that Paul didn't write the book of Hebrews, because there's only one list in the book of Hebrews. <laughs> and so Paul does lists all the time. He's got one list in 2 Corinthians that had, I think, 31 items in it. And this one has 25 in it. This is one of his longest lists. And then look, and then this is the really coolest one. All right, brainless, faithless, or senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, thoughtless. Okay, now you can't always do this kind of imitation, but this really gets across the kind of almost pounding force of what Paul's trying to get across. He's trying to enumerate things that are serious problems and he it's almost like blows of a hammer you know he's nailing these out and any way we can sort of structure this thing to do this like and this is what i let me just show you how i did this um okay uh, to fill their lives up with all kinds of unrighteousness, moral looseness, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, spite, gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, aggressors, boasters, braggers, discoverers of new evil, disobeyers of parents, senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, thoughtless. Okay. You see the, the structure of the list is the thing that Paul is doing. He's creating a beautiful and very carefully constructed structure of these terms. They're simply not just a bunch of words stacked together. Now, that creates a problem for a translator because many times these words are very close in meaning, so you have to find more synonyms. And suppose you only have one word in your language for badness. What do you do? Badness, 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 badness. <laughs> you know, you have to find different ways. And so each of these things has to be handled differently. In this case, in English, we have a lot of rich vocabulary can be used. But you can see that this kind of thing is um, very, very common in Paul. And like I said, I've got all these lists. I've gone through and taken all the lists that Paul has in all of his writings, and I've written them out in some structure. And then also, let me just point this out too. I've got at the end, where are we? Okay, here we are. Yeah, these are each kind of list that he has in each of his writings. And um, I need to make this a little bit smaller so you can see the whole chart. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so I've done, like Romans 123 is single words. There are four of them. It's a list and it's delimited. Delimited means it's separated by chi. Okay, and then I've got various other details. And so I've gone through all of these lists in Paul's writings and characterized them and analyzed them to try to understand how best, how Paul does this, okay? So this is um, very, detailed. This is the kind of thing that you see. And then what I did was I also went through Hebrews, James, and First Peter, just to give a comparison. And the writer of Hebrews does have a few things, but they're, they're usually very small items. The longest one is in Hebrews chapter 11, and that's not really a list. It's a narrative tied together by repeated words, where he says, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Okay, so anyway, that's something interesting to think about. We could spend a lot of time on that. And it took me a lot of time to put this together. But I mean, it's something that stands out to me as a characteristic of Paul's writing that helps us understand some of these things, some of the way he structures things. Okay, I'm looking at my time. I hope we can get through at least one or two more pages here. <laughs> I'm going to let you have this whole list. But anyway, you, this whole document. All right. Chapter two, verses seven through 10. Let's look at those here. Let me, where are we? Okay, there we are. Chapter two, verses seven through 10. Okay. 
Tois men kati for monen ergu agathu doxon kai timen kai after sien zetusi zoin ionion. Tois de ex eretheas kai apethusa si men te aletheia pethomenus de te adikia thimos kai orge flipsis kai stenoth korea epi pasan psychen anthropu tu kadel gazomenu to kokon, judaio te proton kai elenos. All right, this is, um, let me see if I have this. Okay, no, I didn't chart this one out. But this is a place where you have what we call chiasm. To those who um, do the good, and it corresponds to all those who do the bad at the end. And then, so we've got this here, this corresponds to this down here. Um, and then you've got the two middle parts, those who, um, Men, ergu, agathu, doxon, tantumain. We got the good guys and we got the bad guys. All right. And the results for each. So, this is what we call a chiastic structure where the outside pieces and the inside pieces match. Okay. It's called chiasm because of the Greek letter he. It makes an X if you line up things. Okay. The outer parts correspond and the inner parts correspond. Okay. Chiasm is very common in biblical writing, especially in the Old Testament. It's all over the place. And inverted writing, where you have multiple layers of outside all the way to a center point, is also a very common structure. Um, this is very interesting when we come to the story when Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, and he's saying, don't give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before a swine, um, lest they trample under them, them under their feet and turn and rend you. All right. The dogs are the ones who turn and rend. It's the pigs that trample them under their feet. It's a chiasm. The dogs don't give what's holy to dogs because they'll turn and tear you apart. Don't give your per don't cast your pearls before swine because they're going to trample on them. Okay. The chiasm shows us how to interpret the passage. Okay. You could say. Don't give what is holy to dogs nor cast your pearls before swine because the pigs will trample the pearls and the dogs will turn and attack you. Okay. See, just by adding the antecedents of eat, we've made the passage easier to understand. Okay. So chiasm is an interesting structure here. Let me go back to where, there we are. Okay. <clears throat> All right. 17 through 20. Um, this is just a aside here. I'll just mention this. Um, verse 17, Paul says this. Idesu judaios eponomadze, kai eponopaue to nomo, kai kauhase en teo, kai gnoske sto thelima, to e dokimadze sta diaferanta, kake hume ek tu nomu, pepoithas se auton, e doigon enai tuflon, foston, en scoti, pai deltain, afronon, didaskalon, nepion, echunta ten morphos en tes gnosios, kai e sefa aletheas en to nomo. That is one big sarcastic statement. <laughs> Paul is talking like this person would talk about himself with a little bit of a twinge. He's sarcastically describing the self-righteous person, okay? The person who thinks he's righteous whether he is or not, the person who's proud of his righteousness. And he does it with sarcasm, okay? Sarcasm is a very difficult thing to translate. It's very difficult to get across the tone of sarcasm, okay? How do we make this sound like Paul is not complimenting? He's not saying this guy is this most wonderful Christian you could ever imagine. He's not saying that at all. As a matter of fact, he is poking fun. He is, he is as it were, criticizing this person's opinion. So how do you get that across? Well, first of all, you have to recognize it in the text. <laughs> That's the first thing. Then second, you have to go to your language and think, what do we do to show sarcasm in our language? What little things do we do that indicate that we're really talking sarcastically? Okay. Usually these are little kind of maybe sort of words like, oh, really? You really think you're this, huh? We say things like that, okay? We can add things that are function words or tone words 
little tiny things that indicate that this is sarcasm, okay? And so all of this lend, points out the fact that we have to learn how to handle sarcasm. If you're ever gonna translate second Corinthians, you better be an expert on sarcasm, okay? <laughs> when Paul gets to chapters nine through 13 of, of second Corinthians, he writes advanced degrees in sarcasm. Okay, he goes way overboard in, in sarcastic, carefully worded, but very, very pointed speech about the problems among the Corinthians. Okay, so sarcasm is a really important thing. He says, I robbed other churches. Uh, what was the thing I did wrong? I didn't take I didn't take any money from you. I'm terribly sorry that I was so rude as to not take money from you. <laughs> and so he handles these things in such a way to point out he's being sarcastic. And sarcasm is um, something we have to learn how to handle in translation. Okay, let's go back there. So um, comments, questions. I should always remember to pause and make sure I'm not missing anything. Dr. Arnold, how are we doing here? I think we're good. I think we can okay. keep on rolling. All right, good. Okay, well, I'm good at that. I'm a racehorse, so we'll keep going. All right, um, dealing with sarcasm, sarcasm, and then chapter three, verses one through eight. Now, I'm not going to take time to read all of this, but it's important to realize that what is critical in all of this We've got back and forth statements and everything. We have to be able to follow the path of the argument in order to translate and to understand and exegete effectively. So following the argument to produce a proper translation by first getting a proper understanding. And I, I haven't mentioned this, but I tell my translators this all the time, and I think it applies to exegetes. Your first task as a translator or as an exegete is not to translate or exegete, it's to understand. The first task of the translator is not to translate, but to understand. Understanding is the starting point. You have to be sure that as much as you can, you understand the text. Follow the argument to understand why Paul is saying what he is saying in the order that he's saying them. How do each of these phrases fit in with his entire argument? Have you grasped the argument in your own mind? Have you understood how Paul is constructing his argument? And that will help you a great deal with the function words, because the function words are the things that show the hinges of his argument. He's linking things together with these function words that indicate how the argument is to go together. So that's a very, very important part. Okay, um, verse 13, um, we have here um, an expression. Tafos anugmenos talagun saton, tais glosai saton edulusen, ios aspidon hippa tacheli aton. Okay, um, the poison of asps is under their tongue. All right, uh, under their lips, I'm sorry under their lips. Hypotacheli um, Anton, under their lips. Is that what you say in English? Is that the poison of ash or something is under my lips? We would never say under my lips, okay? We would say it's in my lips or inside my lips, or we might even say inside my mouth. In this case, under their lips, you will never find a lexicon that says that hypo means in. I, at least I don't think you will. <laughs> it's not the standard meaning, but in context of how expressions are used, we have to understand we would never say under their lips. As a matter of fact, in your language, maybe they would, but in most languages, they would say it in different ways, okay? And so every language has its own unique way of expressing things. You have to recognize that expressions many times are entire units. Hypotacheliaton would be an entire unit. Hypotacheli might have to be translated with another idiom that matches, okay? So idioms are combinations of words that have a single meaning that is not the combination, that is not the addition of all the words, okay? You have to figure out what the idiom is. Hypotacheliaton, under their lips, might be better said in their mouth, okay? 
the poisons of asp is in their mouth or under their tongue even and find out how best it's it's a difficult thing we have to decide is this an expression that's going to be misunderstood in the target language and how do we handle it okay the important thing is that meaning is always communicated and we have to be careful with the words but in this case she paw is a function word and we have to figure out how best to use it. Okay, so I would probably retain lips, but I would probably say something like inside their lips, okay? Okay, um, four, two. Um, um, ti un rumen abram, um, ton paterimon, heri kenai kata sarka, egar abram ex ergon edia ectikayote, eke kaukema, al u pros ton theon, pros ton theon, to the Lord. Okay. Um, pros ton theon is a um, phrase that could mean a number of existing things. And I call this quizzing the lexicons and testing a translation. When I'm trying to figure out how to translate a function word, I first do go to the lexicons and at least see what they say about it, okay? But then I, I test different translations. I think of all kinds of different ways I could say this. Because of God, to God, with God, about God, for God's benefit, according to God, toward God, with regard to God, in God's opinion, compared to God. Okay, so I, none of these, this is just brainstorming. I'm just coming up with possible ideas. And then I decide which of these I think really works best. And let's see what I actually did here um, in chapter four. And what I said was, but it wouldn't be about God. He has reason to boast, but it wouldn't be about God. He wouldn't be boasting about God if he was righteous himself, he'd be boasting about himself, okay? So you have to decide what is going to work there. About God seems to me to be the best word for that thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that pros means about. What it means is that about corresponds in function in this passage to what pros does in the other passage, in the Greek, okay? All right, chapter five, verse five. And there's all kinds of other things we can talk about, but we'll have to keep moving there. Um, five, five, okay, five, five here. Chapter five, verse five. Okay. Pay de el pis u kataiskune, hati agape to theo e kechutai and tais kardias emon, dia penumatas for you to dothentas emon. All right, we have um, this, kataiskune, e kechutai and dothentas. These are all three passives. All right. Passives are very common in Greek. Greek loves the passive construction. It's a very common thing in Greek. The problem is that passive constructions don't work well in other languages many times. As a matter of fact, they don't work all that well in English. English has just about done away with saying passives unless you're talking about a hockey game. If you're a sports commentator and you're talking about an ice hockey game or a soccer game, then passive is really good because the ball gets carried or cast around so fast or the puck gets passed around so fast, you can't tell who's it doing. So you just say, it is doing this. The ball was passed to who? It was, it was kicked, it was this, you know, because you can't possibly tell it that fast. But in English, we would have a problem with, I mean, many times we have to reverse passives. Let me show you this. Okay, passive to active switch. Greek has a very well-developed passive system, unlike most other languages. All right, so let's see what we could do with this. Let me go to chapter five. And this again, what verse am I in? <laughs> uh, verse five, sorry. Okay, verse five. Um, Hope doesn't disappoint us because the spirit of God gave us, because the spirit God gave us causes God's love to flow into our hearts. All right, now in that case, I've changed all three of the passives to actives. Hope doesn't disappoint us, all right? Because the spirit of God, the spirit God gave us 
causes God's love to flow into our hearts. All right. So switching to passive from passive to active is also very, the problem is sometimes you don't know who the actor is. And that's the biggest problem is sometimes it's hard to tell exactly who's doing it, which is why the passive is there. But the passive is simply a construction in um, the language that means certain things. It's sometimes done for emphasis, but like if you say, um, he destroyed, the, the house was destroyed by the builder. It's the same meaning as the builder destroyed the house, okay? And you can even make that a noun, the builder's destruction of the house, all right? <laughs> you know, all of those mean the same thing, but the grammatical structure is very different. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. Now, here's a very interesting one. Look at verse 12 in chapter five. All right. Verse 12. Dia tuta hospel di henos. Okay. Dia tuta hospel di henos. These are five function words. <laughs> There's five function words in a row here with no content words until we get to anthropu. Now this is complicated. Um, let me show you. Um, five function words and word. Function words are not translatable, but they are transferable. And we notice that verse 12 is an incomplete sentence and Paul never gets back to it. It's interesting. He starts out, he does an incomplete sentence and never gets back to what he was, what he was gonna say about hostel. He says, for as by, and then he never gets back to it. It's just a part of what he wrote. He just, it's not like he made a mistake. He just got started and then they, he took it another direction. So verse 13 is two sentences with a semicolon in between. So again, we see five function words in a row. And so we have to just be aware that these function words um, can mean a lot of different things. Okay, I'm gonna skip um, hoi poloi for this moment. And I'm gonna look at 5, 12 through 21 because I wanna show you something about this. Figuring out how to structure these balanced and bipolar verses. All right, now I've got a document here that shows you what I'm talking about. Okay, here it is. All right, dia tuta, hosper di hanos anthropu hea matia eis ton kosman eis eothen dia teis amatias hathanatos, kai hutos eis pantas anthropus hathanatos, um, a di eothen, en ho, en ef ho, pantas hematon, achrigar nomo hamatia ein en kosmo hamatia dek uke logis detai me ontos nomu, al ebasilios en hodanatos apo adam mechrimo seos, kai epitus me apartenantos epito on the myomati tes parabasios adam, hosis den tupos tu melantos, al uchos proparaptoma, hutos kai to charisma. I'm not going to take time to read this because it's a long passage, but you notice that we have a structure, host per uchos, all right, we got. Uch hosos, right, what he does here is he say, uch hos hutos, uch hos hutos. Well, it doesn't say hutos there, but you can supply it in the thinking. Uch hos, hos hutos. There's a balanced structure throughout this passage that is very helpful for understanding what these statements mean. I've struggled with translating these before and came to realize that <clears throat> the passages, if structured like this, you can actually see the structure and what corresponds to what. So basically what I did was I copied the entire text down and then I broke things down and spaced it so that the corresponding elements match up with each other. And you'll notice that verses 13 and 14 are kind of a little parentheses, okay? He has an explanation there. And he does the same thing <coughs> in a couple other places. He does, um, um, now that one's balanced. Um, um, not later on. I guess it's that's the only one in this passage. Verses thirteen and fourteen are kind of a little parentheses where he goes out of the structure. But by looking at this kind of structure, we can see how best to translate and to handle all of these elements. He's making comparisons and he's showing how these things work. So let's see if we can see how this works in translation. Um, starting in verse twelve. Okay, 
So then, just as by one person sin came into the world, so sin by, came by death, thus, because everyone has sinned, death came unto all people. And then you see verses 13 and 14. You see, sin was in the world before Moses' law, but without the law, no one can be charged with sin. Yet death still reigned from Adam to Moses, even for those who had not sinned in the same way as Adam's direct breaking of God's one commandment. Adam is a type of one to come. But unlike his trespass, the free gift is like this. Since through the trespass of that one man, the many have died, God has a much more abundant grace and gift through that grace. It is the grace of this one man, Jesus Christ, which is overflowed to the many. Also, unlike the effect of that one that sinned, the gift is like this, because judgment on that one brought condemnation. Out of these many trespasses, the gracious gift of this one brought righteousness. And so what I did throughout the passage is I used that and this to indicate that for Adam and this for Jesus. And that way you can keep track of the pronouns. The, the, the hutos, the Greek article, has a um, almost a hutos force at times. And so ha can be translated as, as this or that sometimes because it does work as a uh, demonstrative pronoun sometimes. It has that kind of element to it. So this kind of structure, as I've said, let me show you that chart again. I've made several structures, charts like this. It helps me break down and understand the relationships during the passage. And I'll show you a couple others just to show you how this works. Um, Romans um, 6.23 um, is again, um, Romans, um, <clears throat> yeah, 6, um, 3 through 16, or actually through, Nine through 23, the whole chapter is a very careful parallel type of back and forth, what I call bipolar statements, where one's one side and the other side is the opposite in some ways. Paul does a great deal of this in Romans, and they, they're easier to understand if you see the same type of structure. Like, for instance, <clears throat> In chapter five, he contrasts Jesus and Adam and Jesus. In here, he compares Jesus to us. And then he pairs later in the chapter, he compares the old man to the new man. All right, so he does these bipolar type of statements where he shows the comparisons just by the, these matching statements. And so this kind of, um, these kind of bipolar statements are very important. And one thing is, is the ellipses in the structure can be filled in from other parallel structures. Sometimes you see that Paul leaves out the corresponding element and you can fill it in from the previous one just in your understanding. Also, chapter five is Christ and Adam. Chapter six is Christ is us, and then the old us versus the new us. Okay, um, we are getting really close here, so I think I'm gonna um, do one more thing, and then we'll see if there's any other question. Ara un. Chapter five, verse eighteen. Um, Paul has this unique ara un, ara un. Interesting thing is that these two words, ara and un, essentially mean the same thing. It's sort of like saying, therefore, therefore. <laughs> okay. And so expression of ara un is only found in Paul's writing. This is a unique expression, a unique combination in Paul, and it seems to signal a summary or principal statement in the train of thought. Notice ara un is found in Galatians once, Ephesians once, 1 Thessalonians once, 2 Thessalonians once, but eight times in Romans. Romans is a logical, very carefully logically constructed argument throughout, particularly the first eight chapters, but also 9 through 11 also. And so these function words of logic and comparison, but this ara un, I've concluded that it's a kind of a, so therefore, I've got my conclusion. I want you to notice this conclusion. And so Paul uses that ara un to signal a point in his discussion where he wants you to take notice and think about what he said. Okay, this is a discourse structure. This is part of the way Paul 
pulls a phrase out of the middle of things and say, look at this, pay attention. I want you to think about this phrase. Okay, so ara un is a, it seems to signal a summary or principal statement in the train of thought. Okay, um, we got through two pages, <laughs> almost three. All right, that, um, that's a lot of stuff, you know. So um, I, I will let you look through these rest of these notes at your, at your leisure, but that's probably enough for today. But let me just ask, are there questions or comments or anything else that anybody would like to ask or do at this time as we conclude the last seven minutes? <laughs> um, so here's a, maybe in a more extended, ah, here we go. Uh, you asked, or someone asked here, you said something about fronting function. Okay, okay. Do you wanna explain yes. what you mean by that? Okay, that's good. We'll do that right there, 520. The word de and the word chi mean essentially the same thing, but de does something that chi doesn't. Um, let me just show you in verse five, verse 20. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. We have, um, all right, there are chi's in there, but notice what it says in verse 20. Nomos de parisilthen. All right, de is what we call a post-positive, right? In other words, it never comes first in the sentence. De and chi are similar, but de allows something to be fronted. Paul is doing this argument about the, um, you know, that um, there is, a, you know, he's talking about one man sinners and everything and all this, the obedience of one um, <clears throat> um, brought many to righteousness. No most de, Paul they say them but the law came in. And by using de, I can front a word and give it emphasis, okay? If I said kainomos polyseothen, my meaning would be essentially the same thing. I could have said kainomos polyseothen, but by saying nomos de, I can say kai is means but too, and yes does, but de fronts something. It allows me grammatically to take something that would not be the first and put it first in the sentence. And if you see this particularly, I noticed, I've not been point, had this pointed out in some of the comparisons between Matthew and Mark in the gospel parallels where they're talking about the same thing. And sometimes they use de to front something. So it puts a little bit of emphasis on that. So fronting means that something is bumped to the front in the syntax to give it emphasis. Like for instance, in English, I could say, I went to town today. But if I say, it was town I went to today, I have fronted town, okay? That's to show that I didn't go somewhere else. I went to town. It wasn't to my garden, it was town I went to today, okay? By fronting, it means you put something in a prominent place in the syntax that it wouldn't ordinarily have, okay? All right, and this is all, you see what the writers do. Why are they putting this there? De allows fronting and it's it's as an interesting function in that regard. Okay. That's really interesting, that's fun. Um, could you talk for, just a helpful, anyway, I've never heard that as an insight. Um, could you talk for a second? I We had messaged a little bit about the question of righteousness. Right. And the reason I'm asking this is because I, I got, I was asked by a guy in a primarily Buddhist context, uh, his situation where they didn't really have a word for sin and righteousness, they would talk about pain. Uh, yes. That was kind of suffering was the closest thing to sin. So how would you well, handle, handle those kinds of situations? Well, the couple of things, I'm, I'm, so I'm glad you mentioned that because I remember you asking about that and I thought about that quite a bit. First of all, the Greek, and the Hebrew words for sin both mean essentially the same thing, which is to miss the mark, okay? As a matter of fact, um, at the end of Judges, when they're talking about the Benjamites that they're fighting, they said the Benjamites could sling a stone at a hand, hand breadth and not sin, hand, hand, hair's breadth and not sin. Well, the word is sin in Greek, but it doesn't mean sin, it means miss, okay? so. The first thing I would explore in such a situation is the idea of finding a phrase 
that might work better than a single word. In other words, miss the mark, all right? Or fail to do, or something like that. That would be the first thing I would do is, is look at it that way. The other thing is to do, like I said about the word sin in, in Greek, make a list of everything that you can think of in that language that has something to do with guilt, wrongdoing, making a mess, failing in some way or another. Make list everything you can think about. As a matter of fact, I would even go to somebody else in your language who speaks your language and say, how do you say mess up? <laughs> or how do you say make a mistake? How do you say, what, what can you think of as ways to say that we did something that we shouldn't have done? And then let them come up with words. And so come up with as many words as you can come up with. Um, this is something we often do with language groups where we get them to just brainstorm, which means come up with any kind of word they can think of in a semantic domain, in a domain of meaning. And by generating these words, it's like having a treasury of words. That's what the word Greek the word thesaurus means anyway. You have a treasury, you have a strong box full of valuable words. And so that's the point I would start with. But also the idea of miss the mark might be a good way to start out with the word righteousness. Because I understand, I know that um, most languages don't have a Christian vocabulary. It has to be constructed. You have to figure out how to um, say it. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting in Chad, um, in Africa, the word for bless is to remove the lips from the head, which means to kiss somebody basically as a sort of a blessing. In other words, it's an action described. And again, sometimes um, in Togo, we had, they didn't want to use the word for um, priest, for priest, there was a local word for priest, but it was a word connected with the pagan sacrifices to the spirits. And so they came up with a phrase, they said the animal sacrificer, and that one worked for priest instead of the local work for the person who kills animals to satisfy the spirits. Again, a, a phrase can take the place of a single word sometimes. The problem is, of course, then the phrase can get long, but you try to make it as compact as possible. We have five different ways of handling unknown concepts. That's one is to come up with a phrase. The other is to um, <clears throat> use a foreign word that is in a neighboring language. And then sometimes you can use a foreign word and qualify it, like with a word that's known, like a, particularly with animals, this works, like you'd say a camel animal, if they didn't know what a camel was, you'd use the word camel, you know. Or <clears throat> another one would be to find something that's more general or something that's more specific. Okay, and so these things can be done. It rarely works to create a word because people won't, won't accept it. Language has to create its own words <laughs> and you can't really do it for them. <laughs> but if you use a phrase, I remember we had this discussion in Northeast India between the idea of how are we gonna translate church? And they wanted to say, they had two different ideas. They said believer group or spirit group. And we finally decided that believer group was the best one to use. So they used believer group for the word church. And that was just two words, believer group. And that worked, okay? So again, you sometimes making a phrase will work. If you were hypothetically gonna be working in Arabic, would you use Allah? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> and I will tell you honestly that I know of groups that have done that and I know of groups that haven't done it and it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. The biggest issue of Allah is that the word Allah in he Arabic means the God, Al-Ilah. Al-Ilah, Ilah is the word for God and Al is the article. Al-Ilah means the God. And it's combined Allah, it's just been melded together. And I think this, um, we didn't do that in Mali, we used Yerkoi, which means our Lord, okay? But that was already well established. But a neighboring language, Bambari, used Allah. And nobody seemed to mind one way or the other. The thing that you have to remember is that Allah in the Quran, what, what the Quran says about God or about Allah is not so much wrong as it is uninformation. There's just nothing. 
the the Quran says very very little about God. He says he's merciful and gracious, and he's the all powerful one. Beyond that, there is practically no theology about Allah in the Quran. And so we're not really necessarily bringing in bad baggage. As a matter of fact, it may be in some cases a way for them to recognize that we do worship the same God. And quite honestly, uh, historically, Islam was based upon Christianity and Judaism. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that it's a bad thing. As a matter of fact, I'm, I haven't done it yet, but I've seen it done and it doesn't seem to make a difference. <laughs> so. Very interesting. Again, you know, one, yeah, of the, uh -huh. one of the takeaways I'm getting here that's uh, just intriguing to me is, so, so, so there's some summative disciplines, I think of like engineering in relation to the pure sciences where mm -hmm. it, you could say, you know, okay, you're not really in the pure sciences, but in fact, you have to understand all the pure sciences and it's summative because you're building on the foundation of all those things. And that's kind of the impression I'm getting out of what you're doing here with translation. It's like you end up having to have done all the work in the pure sciences of exegesis and linguistics and all of this, right. because, I mean, you're doing something that is a practitioner discipline, but you right. have to have done all the work underneath. <laughs> yes. I think that's a good way of putting it. In other words, the, the linguistics is a science. And exegesis is really a science. And lexicography, all of these things are uh, disciplines that are carefully defined. Text criticism is a discipline. And again, then you have to figure out exactly how to apply it. You know, all right, so I'm, I'm, I'm an engineering major and I'm building a bridge that nobody else has built before. So what basic principles that I already know and have well established in my mind and I've done in other places, how do I apply them in the given situation? And um, <clears throat> yeah, translation builds upon exegesis, but it has to go beyond it because unlike exegesis, you have to do something about every word. It's the same way with a commentary. Commentators can skip a word, but the translator can't. <laughs> We've got to do something with everything. And so really sooner good. or later, something has to be done with every single part. Yeah, that's great. Uh, very helpful. Uh, I wish we could um, chat more like this. And, you know, anyway, but just a limitation of time here. Sure. Something that I appreciate very much was your generous willingness to share the uh, the translator's handbook. And I, I enjoyed and benefited from looking through it. And I'm enjoying or I'm looking forward to kind of going through some of the future chapters that I didn't get through. Okay, well, so good. thank well, you for that. Go ahead. I should say this, just a commercial, we are always interested in people who would like to be a part of translation because there is always a need. There is still a great need in the world. As a matter of fact, not only still, this is the time for translation. This is the time. And if you're at all interested and if you have a people group or you are a part of one that needs a translation or you know of a group and you have the skills, we can train you in the principles beyond that and uh, help you get there. But it it's, involves people who have a propensity for detail, people who are willing to take time with many, 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 many details, <laughs> okay? And um, I will, uh, Dr. Arnold, I will send you these different documents that I've shown so that people can have them and I can share them with you. Um, you may not understand them all. My notes in the um, Romans class thing are somewhat abbreviated. I wrote them for my benefit, so they may not be clear to everybody, but I'll try to look them over and see if there's anything I should expand on and things like that. But for the most part, I just signaled out things that I thought should be looked at and noted. And, um, Hopefully it'll help you. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that your class continues with Dr. Arnold and God blesses your work. Thank you. Thank you. I'll I'll build on your, um, what you called an advertisement a little bit, just to say, you know, there's lots going on in the world of translation also that is not built on solid foundations in terms of doctrinal commitments. Exactly. So anyway, as I said, Bibles International, they're, they're gonna come from they're going to come from fundamental pre-commitments about the biblical text and about theology that are going, they're going to seek to be faithful to it. And, uh, right. and you're going to see that in the decisions they make. So I commend that also and I'm grateful for well, it. 
We believe the text is not only inspired, but it is words, the words are important. And just because I do not literally translate every word does not mean that every word isn't accounted for. We account for every word, but we don't translate necessarily every word. Every word has an effect on the meaning and the meaning and the words are translated as they relate together, so. Thank you. All right. Thank you again for this time. Thank, Thank you all for joining us. And then we'll pick up uh, next time on Thursday with the remainder of the exegesis section on Romans. So uh, good evening or have a good day to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.